uh, comes and gets back in fellowship with the Lord, whatever. Like. The Master Baptist Church on Witcher Creek. It's preaching time with Pastor Randy Wilson. And to tell them it's a fundamental Bible believing Baptist church. You ought to go there. So I, I try to tell folks, you know, close by where there's a fundamental church and uh, to get in it. But it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We. Uh, Known the Ingrams ever since way, way back, many, many years ago. I knew their kids when they were real little, and now they're uh, married and got kids of their own. Uh, you know, I was, I was at a meeting the other night with Glenn Matthews, my good friend, and he said, it's good to have my good friend Roger Mullins here, and said he was director at Crossroads about 130-some years. <laughs> and, uh, I said, I know I'm... I'm getting old, but I don't think I'm that old. <laughs> I said, you're pretty close, Brother Matthews. And, uh, but uh, it's, it's good to be here tonight and, and amongst friends. Amen. You know, God's people are the most wonderful people. They are the wonderful, most, you know, wonderful people in all the world. Yeah. And, uh, and, and the brother said, you know, that uh, we're on the, the same page. And uh, so that's great. Can two walk together except they be agreed? No, you, that's what Amos asked the question. Can two walk together except they be agreed? And, uh, and you can't. You can't walk together if you don't agree. You'll be a fussing and a fighting. And uh, all right, but it's, it's, it's good to be here tonight. And if you have your Bibles, I trust you do. Would you turn with me to the book of Psalms, if you would please, Psalm number one. Psalm number one. Uh, Buster, that was good, good singing, brother. Yeah, I like that. That was good singing. And that was good harmonica playing, brother, and, and good guitar playing, uh, ladies and gentlemen. There's a lady up here. Where's she at that plays that uh, guitar? Raise your hand. Where'd you go? You're right there, right there in front of me. And... Uh, I like that. Well, I like the old songs, don't you? Yeah. yeah. Logan, how old are you now? 18. Boy, you, you've been here since you was a little boy, haven't you? I remember coming here, and, and you were just a little feller, and I come in now, and you're an old man. I mean, you get... <laughs> I was saved at the age of 17, 58 years ago, this coming fall. 58 years ago. Been preaching 40 some of those years. And uh, but it's it's a joy to be here. Uh, Psalm chapter one, if you would please. And uh, uh, while you're turning there, uh, Psalm, you know, if you're not uh, maybe you're a new Christian, you haven't uh, been saved that long, uh, you just kind of uh, open up into the middle of your Bible there, and you'll you'll come to the book of Psalms right after the book of Job, and uh, right before the book of Proverbs. Uh, the book of Psalms, and now that you're there, uh, you might have heard about the little boy. I may have told this here before, but you, uh, but uh, I'm sure you've got some folks here that, whether I've told it or not, you, you can hear it again. But uh, you may have heard about the little boy that he uh, he had a doggy that he thought so much of, you know, and one day his little doggy died, and uh, he went to the, the Baptist preacher in the community, he said, uh, uh, preacher, he said, you know, my little doggy died. He said, Sonny, I'm sorry to hear that. I really am. And he said, well, preacher, do you think maybe you could preach my doggy's funeral? And uh, the Baptist preacher, not being accustomed to preaching a dog's funeral, you know, uh, he said, uh, well, Sonny, he said, uh, uh, I, I've never preached a dog's funeral before, but said, I'll tell you what, said, there's a fine Methodist preacher down the road just just moved in uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and said, I'm, I'm sure he'd be glad to preach your little doggy's funeral. He said, well, thank you, preacher. I appreciate that. The little boy started to walk away, and he stopped, and he thought. He turned around, he walked back to the Baptist preacher, and he said, preacher, how much do you think I ought to give that Methodist preacher for preaching my doggy's funeral? Maybe two, three hundred dollars, somewhere along in that. Baptist preacher said, come here a minute, son. He put his arm around him and said, you didn't tell me your doggy was a Baptist. <laughs> Okay, let's stand together, shall we?
Psalm number one, very, very familiar portion of the word of God again. We'll read down to the conclusion of verse six, which is the entire psalm. Blessed, that word blessed here means happy. Are you happy tonight? Amen. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, Amen. nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this blood bought privilege we have tonight to stand, Lord, behind this pulpit, this sacred place. It's been set aside to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, only eternity will reveal how many sermons have been preached on the gospel from this pulpit down through the years. And our Father, we thank you for once again that we can do that on this side of eternity as uh, a guest speaker here tonight and a friend of the pastors to come and to preach the word of God. Lord, I need you tonight. I pray for fresh oil. Pray for the anointing of the Holy Spirit as I preach. Speak to hearts tonight. God, if there's somebody here that's not saved, Lord's on their way to hell. If they're not saved, they're on their way to hell. And tonight I pray, God, they'd get under conviction to get saved. I pray for that one that's here tonight that may be saved and yet out of fellowship with you, Lord. May tonight they get back in fellowship with you. Thank you for the good singing, Lord, the good testimonies. Lord, the sweet spirit of the Lord that was with us tonight. And Lord, our spirits, uh, the spirit of man. Lord, our spirit bears witness with their spirit that they're children of God. And we thank you for that tonight. Bless us now as we preach. Bless your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, baby. Seated. Good crowd tonight. Good crowd. You could be anywhere tonight, but you chose to be here. You chose to be in the house of God because you want to be. Amen. You want to be, like the pastor said. And he said he had a preacher here this morning, and uh, he, he, everything he had, you know, in order for those who go to sing and preach and whatever. But he wanted to be in the house of God. That's the desire that God puts in the heart of his people. Amen. The devil doesn't do that. I'll tell you that right now. The devil, that's the furthest thing he wants you from is in the house of God, is a child of God. And, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, it's good to be here and, and we're here because we want to be in the house of God. I want you to look, if you will, please, at verse 1. Look at verse 1. Blessed, happy is the man, the woman, the boy, the girl, the teenager. Happy is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. I want to take this verse of this psalm and preach tonight on those three. I want to preach on the happy man, the happy woman, the happy teenager, the happy boy, the happy girl. Who is this happy man? Who is this happy woman? Who is this happy teenager? He is declared here by what are known as negatives. Nothing affirmative is said about him. For example, we are told what he does not do as opposed to what he does do. Three things that he does not do. Number one, he does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. He does not stand in the way of sinners. And he does not sit in the seat of the scornful. As if goodness came by not doing things. 
But wait a minute. When God himself came down from heaven, he took precisely the same course as did the writer here of this psalm. And what did he say? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness and so forth. And uh, so it is in teaching your children. You, you do not start out with your little toddlers. You do not begin with them by telling them what they must do. Uh, it, but, but it's no, no, you know, uh, no, no, that's a no, no. You go around that's a yes, yes. That's a no, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Why? Because you're trying to save them from trouble. You're trying to save them from, from getting hurt. If they, uh, you know, when they start uh, walking about and they reach their hand up on the coffee table, you say, no, no, there may be a hot cup of coffee there. Or they walk up to a, a little stove, they get near it, you say, no, no. They learn that this is a no, no, and that's a no, no, and that's a no, no, you see. And uh, uh, so uh, if you said to your child, uh, uh, something that he must do all the time, you'll find it very difficult to accommodate him in his early perception of life. But if you tell him not to do certain things, uh, you'll find there are more ways of saying thou shalt not than there are of saying thou shalt, and you'll get to his early, in his early perception of life. And so he says, uh, for the happy man, the happy woman, the happy teenager, he is the one that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, does not stand the way of sinners, and does not sit in the seat of the scornful. These three things that he does not do if he's to be a happy man, for the man that does walk, in the counsel of the ungodly, the man that does stand in the way of sinners, and the man that does sit in the seat of the scornful is not a happy man. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, uh, I mean, tonight, if we were to say, say tonight after the service, for example, let's say that a, a group of us men got together and we said, now we're going to go out into community and we're going to find us a happy man. We're going to find us a happy teenager. And some says, well, I'm going to find a happy woman. So we're all determined as a group we're going to go out and we're going to find these and we're not going to return back to the church together until we find us a happy man or a happy woman, a happy teenager. And so we set out, but wait a minute, hold it. The psalmist tells us there is one direction in which you need not go. He said, I've been down that road before you, and you'll not find a happy man, a happy woman, or a happy teenager walking in the counsel of the ungodly. We say, well, we're still, we're determined, we're still going to go out and find us a happy man somewhere. We're going to find it. The psalmist tells us, wait a minute, I can save you trouble in another direction. I've been down that road before you. If you want to find a happy man, a happy teenager, a happy woman, you will not find them standing in the way of sinners. We're still determined. We're going to find us a happy man. We're not going to come back till we find us a happy teenager, a happy woman. Then where do we go? The psalmist says, I can yet save you a journey. I've been down that road. You will not find him sitting amongst the seat of the scornful. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ, listen to me tonight. How much of the devil's territory is left for exploration? I mean, the psalmist has taken up, number one, the counsel of the ungodly. Number two, he has taken up the way of sinners. And number three, he has taken up the counsel, I mean the seat of the scornful. You take these three things from the satanic empire and you've left nothing. You see, there is a perilous progress in sin. I mean, the man on the streets of Skid Row and the back alleys of forgotten men that you and I worked with, uh, uh, my friend, uh, you do not find that him to become a drunkard overnight. It doesn't happen. 
You do not find the, 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 the dope head uh, who has to have a shot in the arm, a cheap shot in the arm to make it through the day. You will not find him, my friend, becoming a dope head overnight. You do not find the sex fiend uh, becoming a sex maniac overnight. What do you mean, preacher? Listen, there's a step-by-step progress in sin. These three places, a man, a woman, a teenager, a boy, a girl, must avoid if he or she is to be a truly happy man, a happy woman, a happy teenager. The counsel of the ungodly, the way of sinners, the seat of the scornful. I said there is a perilous progress in sin. It's a step by step. I'll use myself tonight. I'll just say, first of all, I contend myself with just walking in the counsel of the ungodly. It is an occasional companionship. A meeting only, now and then. For a little while you see me with them until some better influence calls me away. Perhaps a remembrance of my mother's prayers. Or perhaps a sentence from a letter from a friend. Or perhaps a verse of scripture shot into my mind. But by and by, where do you find me? I'm standing in the way of sinners. They've gained a greater power and a completer fascination over me, and I've learned to love them too well, Brother Pastor. I linger much longer now in their society. It's almost an impossibility to pull me away from them. What's happening, preacher? I'll tell you what's happening. The poison is working. The leaven is spreading. And my condition is more fixed and more hopeless by far. At last, where do you see me? I am sitting down in the seat of the scornful. You see, uh, I'm no longer content with just walking in the counsel of the ungodly. I no longer get the kick just by kind of stand in the way of sinners, I'm now sitting down in the seat of the scornful. I'm at home with those who laugh at God and Christ and heaven and hell and the church and the preacher and the soul winner. I've become a scoffer. You cannot discriminate me from them. I've joined their ranks. I am one of them. I'm one of their number. Their resorts are mine. Their sneers and their sarcasms are mine. Oh, dreary ending of a dreary journey. Blessed or happy is the man, the woman, the boy, the girl, the teenager who says, I cannot, I will not, I dare not at the first allurement of sin. Stay away from the counsel of the ungodly. Stay away from the way of sinners. Don't sit down in the seat of the scornful. These three places, a man, a woman, a boy, a girl, a teenager, must avoid if they're going to be a truly happy man, a happy woman, a happy teenager. Ask around. Talk with some of the older saints of God that have been down that road uh, like the psalmist. Ask them what it's like before they got saved. And they'll tell you, don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Number one, the counsel of the ungodly. Again, number two, the way of sinners. And number three, the seat of the scornful. The Bible says that the ungodly, now listen, I want to take these three in their perspective. Let's look at the counsel of the ungodly. Who are they, preacher? They are the abnormal, the lawless, 
the ungodly man, the ungodly woman, the ungodly teenager is he or she who never shows a righteous indignation against sin. God's people ought to get a righteous indignation against sin. God's people ought to get a righteous indignation against drug, drugs and alcohol and cigarettes and pornography and premarital sex. God's people ought to get a righteous indignation against rock music, my friend, and homosexuality and lesbianism. We ought to get a righteous indignation against such filth as that. I've often said I wouldn't give you a plug nickel. I wouldn't give you a plug nickel to a preacher that wouldn't preach against the, these sins that I've mentioned tonight. The ungodly crowd. Listen, the Bible says in Proverbs 14, or verse 4 and 14 and 15, Enter not into the path of the wicked. Go not in the way of evil man. He says avoid it. He says, pass not by it. He says, turn from it and pass away from it. Concerning the end of the ungodly man, let's look and see what God said through Jude. Over in chapter 1, there's only one chapter of Jude, but look in verse 14. And Enoch, also the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh, with 10,000 of his saints to the purpose, one of the purposes, to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him, against God. Folks can laugh at God and Christ and heaven and hell all they want to. But the judgment of God is coming. The counsel of the ungodly. So a happy man, a happy woman, a happy teenager must avoid the counsel of the ungodly. Number two, the way of sinners. Who are they, preacher? Well, now, we're all sinners. I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. Now, does that mean I go out and get drunk and, and run around the honky-tonk and run around with my wife and cheat and cuss and gamble? No. But we're sinners saved by grace. We're in the flesh. It would behoove every one of us to say with Peter of old, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O oh Lord. But wait a minute. The class of people here referred to, the way of sinners, the class of people referred to here are those who love to sin, who not only have sinned, but do sin, whose intentions are to sin openly, unblushingly, and willingly when and wherever the opportunity arises. That's the crowd he's talking about. Listen. When a man, a woman, a teenager, or if I meant to be a happy man, they must avoid the counsel of the ungodly if they're going to be a happy individual. Another place is the way of sinners. As I said a while ago, the way of sinners. Not only the counsel of the ungodly, but that next step, the way of sinners. In Isaiah's prophecy, God gives it like this. When a man or a woman or a teenager turns from wickedness to righteousness and from sorrow to happiness, it's to get out of the way of sinners. Is that right? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become New. I don't go the places I used to go. Amen. I don't say the things I used to say. I don't tell the dirty jokes and rear back and laugh like I used to. I don't cheat in cards and gamble like I used to. Brother Pastor, I started that young. A teenager at uh, Washington, Maine, 
back in the 50s. And I'd, I'd stack the deck. I'd take that 52 card uh, deck there and I'd go home and I'd throw the cards up in the air and let them come back on, down on the bed and I'd grab those cards and I could take those aces and shove them on the bottom and those kings and queens and jacks and so forth and then I'd go over to Washington Manor and I'd play with five or six of my buddies. And I, I learned to, to deal like this so fast you couldn't tell the difference. These figures on the bottom was taking them off the bottom for me, the top figures for those, the tops for them. I'd practice and I'd, I'd stack that deck where I could just sh give this man a good hand and this man a little better hand and this man a little better hand, but I got the best hand. That way each man would ante up more and more. Once in a while, I'd deal me a bad hand so they wouldn't catch on. Smart, weren't you? No, I was a low-down, dirty crook. I was a sinner on my way to hell, deceived by the devil. But one day God got a hold of this old boy. God got a hold of me. And I got under old time Holy Ghost conviction. And I walked down the aisle and got saved. Brother, listen, to this day, I don't allow a deck of cards in my house. Why? Because that was my downfall. Yeah. My downfall. I don't play with cards anymore. I don't take a drink of the devil's brew anymore. Amen. Don't tell. And I tell the dirty jokes and make them laugh to where they wouldn't notice I was cheating too. I'm ashamed of that, Brother Randy. I really am. But I thank God because of his grace. Amen. His wonderful grace that reached down and saved me at an early age of 17. If I'd have kept on going like I was, If God had just let me go and went on, I'd have probably wound up probably 21, 22 in Las Vegas gambling and probably got a bullet under my belt for cheating and laid in a on, gambler's grave, the body and the soul in hell. Thank God for his grace. Get out of the way of sinners. Isaiah 55, 7 says, let the wicked, let the wicked turn from his wicked ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Why? Because the way of sinners is the way of sorrow. The way of unhappiness and the way of sorrow. But preacher, and I've had young people tell me this, it feels good to just take a little nip now and then of the devil's brew. Hey, by the way, did, did any of you see on this, the, the headlines this morning, the Sunday paper, where they've uh, come out with a new bottle of beer and they, they named it uh, Sweet Jesus? How was it? Sweet Baby? Sweet Baby Jesus. That's an abomination. That's blasphemy. And they said those... The drinks that they named, that's how sweet it tastes to them. I said, how's a man drink the devil's brew and say, that's sweet to me like sweet Jesus. They don't even know Jesus. Amen. Hello. Thank you. You're welcome. The preacher, it feels good to nip a down in. It feels good to take a draw off the weed, the drugs. It feels good to smoke a cigarette. It feels good to flip through the pornography book. However good it may feel, my friend, to feed your flesh. And that's what it's doing. Whatever of good you may think it promises, it's a false way. It's, its way is misery. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Listen to me, young people. Stay away Amen. from the way of sinners. Don't congregate with them. Amen. Now, you may have to work with them, and, 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 and you can have, you know, the Bible says to make friends with the unrighteous. I know that. 
But that doesn't mean to hang with them, to listen to their dirty jokes and go to the places they go. Stay away from that crowd. There is a way, again, there is a way which seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. When I was director, pastor at Crossroads when it was over on Summer Street, Back in 1974, I went there. Or 1978, I was pastoring there. 1978, I went as director. I was there 78, 79, 80, 81, four years. And then two years up South Park in the men's program. And while I was there, one night I was preaching and there was this woman that came there. She was known as Big Mary. Big Mary must have weighed at least, I don't know, maybe 300 pounds. Maybe, I, I don't know, maybe four. Big Mary, very big, but had the most prettiest face you're going to see on a gal. Very pretty, but big. And Mary was uh, illiterate. And the guys on the street took advantage of her. And you know what I mean. And one night I was preaching at Crossroads. She'd come to the services quite a bit. And one night I was preaching about God's love and how he can change their lives and bring them in off the streets and how he can take the, uh, the harlot and the hormoner and the drunkard and the liar and save them and make a new man or a new woman out of them. And those guys on the back row, they were telling her like this. And she was looking, I saw the tears running down her cheeks. She was, she was under conviction. And I saw these fellows as they kept talking to her. And listen, uh, brother, you're talking about a righteous indignation. I said, you fellows back there on the back row, I said, if you don't want to go to heaven, you want to die and go to hell, then you do it. But you leave somebody else alone that wants to hear the gospel Amen. and learn how to get saved and go to heaven. Amen. Boy, you could have heard a pin drop. You said, preacher, were you scared? No, God was doing preaching, not me. And that night, I gave the invitation. I thought for sure Big Mary's going to walk down the aisle and get saved. But she didn't. And after the service was over, now I'm talking about this verse. There's a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And I walked to Mary after the service was over, and she she kind of come to me, and I was coming towards her and, and, and her uh, boyfriends and went outside. And uh, I said, Mary, why didn't you come down and get saved tonight? I don't know, but, 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 but Brother Mullins, she stuttered. And she said, I, I know I should have, but, but, but not, not now. I said, Mary, Mary, I never called her Big Mary. That was her name in, on Summer Street. Big Mary, I respect it. I said, Mary, why don't you come now and kneel here? Let me show you how to be saved, Mary. Let, let me show you how to be saved. And I said, Mary, and we could get you off the streets. Mary, I'll see to it. We get you in a good hotel, a decent hotel, until we can do more for you. We didn't have the women's program back then at that time. And then she said, no, not tonight, Brother Mullen. She said, I, my boyfriends are waiting on me out there. And I said, Mary, I said, they, he loves me. I said, he's going to put me up in an apartment. And I said, no, Mary, he's not going to do that. Mary's lying to you. All of them are lying. They're not going to put you in an apartment somewhere and give you a place. She said, yeah, he done told me this one. He really cares for me. He's going to take me off the streets, and he's going to put me up. I said, Mary, there's only one thing he's interested in, and that's your body. He didn't care about you. I said, Mary, why don't you get saved tonight? God loves you. Jesus died for you. Why don't you get saved tonight? No, brother, Mullins, not tonight. She was crying all along. Not tonight. Not tonight. I was in my 30s then. I labored and I cried. And I said, Mary, I had tears in my eyes. I said, Mary, please get saved. No, she said, they're waiting for me. I got to go, preacher. I got to go. Let me go. I got to go. Out the door she went. I went home that night, and I told my wife about it. I went to that bed that night, brokenhearted. I thought, well, maybe I'll, she'll come to service, and I'll reach her again. The next day I went to work. I was working a night shift then. And I walked in, and one of my chaplains looked at me and said, Preacher Mullins? I said, yes. Did you hear about Big Mary? I said, 
No. What about her? I said, after you witnessed to her there last night, said her boyfriend was waiting on her down the street. And said she stood in front of her. And, and I even went out on the street in front of there, there on the street there and tried to get her not to go with those guys that night. And anyway, they said she waited there. And after you went home, so they drove by and picked her up. There was a car full of them, and so they hit it up 119, going towards up, you know, Big Chimney Way, and said there was a head-on collision last night, and said they were driving a fast rate of speed, and said Big Mary went through the windshield and took her head off. I broke down with the Clinton. I cried like a baby. I was angry at those guys, the devil's crowd. See, she really thought, she believed that they were going to help her, this one guy. She trusted in him. And I told her, I said, oh, this is the way of sinners. Don't follow them. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The third place. The happy man, the happy woman, the happy girl must avoid is number three, the seat of the scornful. Now notice this going down of the three steps. First of all, it's just listening to the counsel of the ungodly. Then unconsciously, he walks into that next lower step walks in the counsel of the ungodly. And then he begins to stand in the way of sinners. It's a progress, step by step by step. Until finally he is sitting in the seat of the scorn. A man, a woman can laugh at God and Christ and heaven and hell and God's preachers and the church and say, I don't want anything to do with it. They get to that place where they, they just make fun yeah. and laugh. Think, ha ha, big joke. Yeah. And before I bring my third point, listen to me tonight. A Salvation Army officer got up one time at the Salvation Army and back years ago in the 50s, they were more fundamental than now. You know, they were very... and. Uh, there was this preacher that came to preach, the man of God. And he told the story. He said, I'm telling you a true story tonight. He said the place was packed with young people. He said, young people, he said, I was in a service one night, and I gave the invitation. After I got through preaching, I gave the invitation for the sinners to come down and get saved and said, said uh, you know, anybody's right mind don't want to go to hell. He said, there's nobody here who wants to go to hell, is there? He said, there's this young man that stood up in the service, about 21 years old. He said, he laughed at me. He said, ha, ha, yeah, preacher. He said, I want to go to hell. And he said, he turned around and looked at the congregation and said, so long, folks. I'm going to hell. Ha, ha. And he walked out the door, and they said they heard the awful screeching that he had walked out in front of a big tractor trailer. And killed him right there on the spot. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you the truth. You see, God took him at his word, didn't he? He laughed at God for the last time. He laughed at God's preachers for the last time. He laughed at God's people for the last time. He had sit down in the seat of the scornful. Who are they, preacher? Those, as I said at first, who laugh at God and Christ and heaven and hell. And the Bible says in Proverbs 19, 29, Judgment is prepared. Prepared for those that live this kind of a life. Stripes for the back of fools. Actually, it says judgment is prepared for the scorner. Stripes for the back of fools. God have mercy on the man, the woman, the teenager who has gone so far that he can make a joke of his mother's religion. 
who can sneer his father's God and who can scorn the voice of God's word that calls him or her to repentance. Acts 17 and 30 said there's a time when God winked at ignorance, but now, now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. God doesn't ask man to repent. He commands him to repent. It's a commandment of Almighty God to repent, to be sorry for your sins. Why? Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world by that man, Jesus, whom he hath ordained and hath given assurance unto all men, and they hath raised him from the dead. God is going to judge the ungodly man through that man, Jesus Christ. I know I keep referring back to crossroads, but I've had a lot of experiences there. I was also preaching there where you work with me, Randy. It might have been during a time, if it wasn't too long, it's around that time. I was preaching one night. I don't know, maybe you were in a service. I don't remember. But I was preaching that night about the unsaved and how they would bow before God. I said, you may think it's funny now because some are laughing. You know how the rescue mission men off the street, some of them do. Most of them are respectful. But they, I said, you may laugh now, but one day you'll bow before God and you'll confess Jesus Christ. And I, after service was over, and I went back and was sitting at my desk. Man, this guy came and bam, 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 and didn't wait for me to answer the door, buddy. He busted right through the door. He was angry. He said, Preacher, you said in there a while ago when you were preaching that man would stand before God and he would confess. I said, That's right. He said, I want you to know here's one man that will never bow my knee to God. And I'll never confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I said, oh, yes, you will. He said, oh, no, I won't. I said, oh, yes, you will. He said, oh, no, I won't for the third time. I said, oh, yes, you will. He said, where do you get that? I said, let me show you something from the Word of God. I showed him Philippians 2, 9 and 10. Wherefore? God also hath highly exalted him, Jesus, and given him a name above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow to God, of things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I said, Sir, I said, you may never bow your knee in this life. You may never confess with your tongue the Lord Jesus, but just as sure as I'm sitting here in my seat and you're standing there uh, before me one day out there in eternity, you'll bow before God, you'll confess Jesus Christ, uh, but it'll be too late. God will get the glory and he'll say to you, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. And he turned around and walked out the door. I don't know if he ever got saved or not. I don't know. I don't remember seeing him anymore. I hope he did. I hope so. Most people like that go on in their ways. I hope somewhere along the line, man got under conviction and was saved. Listen tonight. Another place, a happy man, a happy woman, a happy boy, that is, if they're going to be happy, is to avoid the seat of the scornful. In closing, I tell churches everywhere I go and preach, I say, that, that's my favorite part. Just in closing, I just close and close and close and close. <laughs> but in closing, who is this happy man? Who is this happy woman? Who is this happy teenager? He is the man, the woman, the teenager who does not walk in the counsel yeah. of the ungodly, yeah. does not stand in the way of sinners, and does not sit in the seat of the scornful. He is the man, the woman, the teenager who says no to alcohol, no to drugs, no to cigarettes, no to pornography, no to premarital sex, no to rock music. 
Hey, by the way, rock music is inspired to the very pits of hell. I hate it. I hate it. Can't stand it. And I'll say this before, before I close. I, the wife and I, with my mother and stepfather, uh, who are now both in heaven, we were eating one day at uh, Captain D, though, or Shoney's. Yeah, Shoney's. Yeah, wife's wagging her head, yeah. Okay, it was a Shoney's. We were eating. And uh, food was wonderful, wonderful. But they had that rock music on. It was so loud, I couldn't even hear my father-in-law uh, just across the table talking to me. I said, what'd you say? He said, I said, if they didn't have that old devilish rock music on, we could hear one another. We'd have to be shouting across the table. The manager heard it. Thank God he did. I meant for him to. He came over and he said, sir, everything all right? I said, the food's delicious. I said, I can't stand your music. That's what you call it. I said, it's so loud, I can't even talk to my mother, my father-in-law, my wife. Everybody I said, it's terrible. He said, I'd been there before, and he said, Mr. Mullins, he said, I'm sorry. I apologize. He said, that, is, that, that music is, is not palatable. I'll go over and change it. And he went over and turned that stuff off. You say, preacher, how'd you do that in a, a restaurant? The devil's crowd don't care how much they holler and yell and scream and, uh, about the, the, the things of the devil. Why shouldn't we? Amen? Listen. Don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Don't stand away of sinners. For if you do, you're going to find yourself sitting down in the seat of the scornful. Isaiah 58.1 says this, and I close. Cry aloud. Also, a guy came across the way and said, Preacher, why do you get excited preaching like you do about sin? You preach against homosexuality and lesbianism, and you preach about, and it wasn't near as bad then as it is now. And uh, he said, you preach against rock music, and you preach against drunkenness and and all they said, well, said uh, you, you, why do you get mad about it for? Why, why do you holler about it? I said, it's because God told me to. He said, what do you mean God told you to? I, I turned to Isaiah 58, 1. I said, what does it say right here? He read it. Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and warn my people of their transgressions. Or shoo my people of their transgressions. And Jacob proceeded. That's what we're for. We're supposed to tell. Because, hey, people are not going to read their Bibles. A lot of them don't even read their Bible. They don't know what this book says. I'm a mean old preacher, aren't I? But I preach like this because I've worked in rescue mission work for 19 years. I've seen drunkards die a drunkard's life. I've seen dope addicts die. I've seen men with their belly swell big, three times the normal size of a basketball, turn yellow as a banana and die in that condition. I know what sin will do to you. You've heard this saying, come on preacher. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay. It'll cost you more than you want to pay. I'm just glad that the Lord Jesus saved my soul when he did at the age of 17 and called me to preach the gospel. Tonight, I've got to say this before I sit down. If you're here and you're not saved, the Bible says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In verse 13 of that same chapter says, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're not saved tonight, Come and say, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know you died for sinners. I repent of my sins. God, I ask you to save me. If you're out of fellowship tonight, come down here and say, Lord, I want to thank you for saving me. I'm sorry I turned my back on you. I want you to forgive me and get up and take up your cross and follow the Lord. Amen, Brother Pastor.